also, just a, in way of reminder, um, as we, not next week, but the week after, as we go back to the 9.30 and to the 11 o'clock services, um, the kids' ministry program will be happening in that 9.30 time. And so if you know families who want their children involved in children's ministry, that will be happening during that time. As we begin this morning, I want to give you, uh, as we begin looking at your word, give you three scenarios, three short scenarios. Scenario number one. You purchase a new electronic device for yourself and you are absolutely ecstatic about it. You get it home and you open up the package or you tear open the package and you pull out your device and underneath your device is a little manual. And and the words that kind of catch your attention and your excitement are the words that say, Please read this manual carefully before using. What do you do? Scenario number two. You're walking or hiking along some bluffs and the view is absolutely breathtaking. You are amazed at the scenery. You are overwhelmed by what you see. And you think to yourself, if I can just get a little bit closer to the edge, and see how far down it is. I think it'll be even more amazing. But as you approach the edge, you see a sign that says, do not pass this point. And you think in your head, but I know that if I pass this point, I will get an amazing picture that I can put on Facebook and Instagram. What do you do? Scenario number three. You're going to remodel or paint one of your rooms in your home. You go to the hardware store, you get some paint, Because you're kind of one of those people who like to get things done, you plan to do it in one day, and you're kind of wondering, how long do I need to wait in between coats? And so you go to the back of the can and it says, for best results, give three to four hours between coats, and you're thinking, ah, if I do it, I can't get it done in one day. What do you do? Three short scenarios. One of instruction, one of warning, and one for best results. Do those words in any way impact your life? Does anything in you change because of those words? We've just spent on that last nine weeks going through a series entitled The the Teachings or the Words of Jesus. And so the question we need to ask is, as we've done that, what difference... Have those words made in our life? Have they changed our lives at all? Is anything different? Tonight we're going to be, this morning we're going to be wrapping up this series and we want to look at one more saying of Jesus or one more set of words of Jesus. It's in Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27. And as we look at these words, they're simply this. Everyone then who hears these words of mine. Everyone then who hears these words of mine. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24 it says this. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and they beat against the house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Let's just pray um, before we look into God's word this morning. Father God, we we thank you, um, as we have done, uh, had the opportunity to just declare uh, your greatness God, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for your spirit that we know uh, makes your word alive in us. I pray that as we look into your word, that it would not simply be a, a parable or a story or something that we're familiar with, but it would be words that change our hearts, our lives, that transform us for your honor and for your glory. And so, God, we pray this in your son's name. Amen. 
Our text this morning begins with two words. Everyone then. Other translations say, therefore, whoever. Therefore, everyone. The words that we're going to be looking at this morning are connected to the previous passage, and that's why those first two words are so important. Everyone then who hears these words, why is he saying that? Why is he pointing us to what he just stated? And so before we look at our text this morning, what we want to do is we want to to try to pull together some context of of both these two passages, uh, the one that we're looking at today and the one just prior to that. In verses 24 to 27, and also the preceding passage, 21 to 23. Both of these passages have to do with a person hearing the words of Jesus and their response. Both of these texts talk about either the impact or the lack of impact that Jesus' words have had on these individuals. And so the people that Jesus is talking about in these two different passages are individuals who have heard the word of God. They've heard the teachings of Jesus. In in the verses just prior to our text, Jesus is contrasting saying and doing. The individuals, like I said, have heard the words of Jesus. And either they said they were going to do something or they have followed through, but they didn't follow through with the right motives. And and Jesus says, if you say you're going to do something or if you follow through with the wrong motives, here's the outcome. The outcome is verse 21. And this is kind of our linking verse between the previous passage and the one that we're looking at this morning. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but to the one who does the will of God of my Father who is in heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. And what Jesus is getting at in this, this, these verses from 21 to 23 is this whole aspect about obedience. The, the importance of, of following Jesus well. A person says they will follow through But they need to follow through with the right motives. Because if if obedience does not happen, there are negative consequences that verse 21 point us to, or verse 23 point us to. Have you ever been asked to do something by somebody? And you're sitting there, you're quite occupied, and you don't really want to do what they've asked you to do, and those famous words come out, I'll do it later. Or, I'll do it in a minute. And and what happens is time passes, you never get to it or you forget about it. And as good as your intentions may have been, it just doesn't happen. And in the verses prior to our text this morning, Jesus is saying it's not good enough to simply say you're going to do something but don't do it. And it's also not good enough to say I'm going to do it and you do it but you do it with the wrong motives. The motives need to be obedience and a heart out of honoring God in what you're doing. And in verses 21 to 23, Jesus is saying that one's final destiny will be settled not by what you have said to him. It will be settled not by what you will say to him on that final day of judgment, but it will be said, but will determine it will be what you have done. Is verbal profession accompanied by obedience and action? And Jesus says simply, if not, you won't get to heaven. And and I think about that, and that's, that's a pretty heavy statement. And so we have to ask the question, how can a person be assured of their standing on the final day of judgment? And it's by obedience to Jesus and his words. Because obedience is so important, Jesus begins our text this morning by referring to this linking verse in the passage before it. And that's why he says, everyone then, or therefore everyone. So in the first set of verses, Jesus is contrasting doing or saying and doing. And in our text today, he's contrasting hearing and doing. 
And then he talks about a parable that, that it, it demonstrates the importance of obedience. He's emphasizing the importance of acting according to his teaching. It's one thing to hear or to know what he has said and even approve of it. It's quite another thing to actually do it. And in the same way, the first passage affects what happens on the final judgment, so will hearing and not doing. Again, has anyone ever asked you to do something and you hear the request, but you don't act on it? You know in your head what needs to be done, but do you actually do it? But by doing it, you're showing that the words that were spoken to you are really important. By not doing it, you're saying, you know what, I don't really agree with that, or I really don't feel like it, so I'm just not going to do it. Your response to what you hear will determine how much you value something that has been said to you. I remember the first year that we were involved in ministry here at the church. Uh, pastor Stan Bromberger was the senior pastor at the time, and we were in a staff meeting. Uh, the building was a lot different than it is now. We were just next door in the room. We got a phone call. The phone was answered, and someone said, well, it's Michelle, it's for you. So I went to the phone, and I picked up the phone, and Michelle said, Randy, you need to come home right away. I've cut my finger, and it's bleeding really badly. We only had one vehicle. Um, and I remember running back to the staff meeting saying, I've got to go. Michelle's cut her finger. I've got to get home. I'm not sure what the situation, how bad it is. And I remember driving down Fifth Street, and all these scenarios are going through my head. What am I going to see when I get through the door? And I remember opening the front door, and there were, there were a few lines of blood on the wall going up the stairs. And I called her name, and I heard nothing. <laughs> and I'm going, bum, 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 bum. And, and, and I go up the stairs, and she's, she's lying down with her hand in the air, trying to stop the bleeding. And we have two young girls, Jasmine and Andrea, who were both quite young at the time. And... And we looked at the situation, we got her to the hospital, and she received some stitches. Why did I respond so quickly? Because I love her. Because I care for her. Because the words that I heard in that telephone when she said, you need to come home right now, were words that, that called for a response. There were words that said, I need to do this. And in regard to the verses that we are looking at this morning, John Stott says this. He says, in these verses, Jesus confronts us with himself. He sets before us the radical choice between obedience and disobedience and calls us to an unconditional commitment of mind, will, and life to his teaching and so in verse 24, we read, everyone who hears these words of mine. Once you've heard the words of Jesus, there are only two options. You can follow through, or you cannot follow through. You can pretend that you didn't hear them, you can try to ignore them, but by doing that, you're saying, I'm not going to follow through on what I've heard. And the reason that Jesus taught his disciples, the reason he instructed his disciples, was so they could know him well. He, he taught his disciples so they would go into the world with the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And so that his father would be glorified and honored. It wasn't simply just saying, here's some information about me. Jesus didn't want his, his, his followers just to be intelligent. It wasn't the class called things that you need to know about Jesus and what he teaches. Jesus taught his disciples so that they would live out what he taught. Ray Vanderland wrote this. The decision to follow a rabbi or a teacher as a disciple meant total commitment in the first century. 
Since the disciple was totally devoted to becoming like the rabbi, he would spend his entire time listening and observing the teacher to know how to understand scripture and how to put it into practice. Jesus describes his relationship to his disciples in exactly this way. He chose them to be with him so they could be like him. The disciples of Jesus were were to be with him. They were to follow him. They were to live by his teaching. They were to imitate his actions and were to make everything else secondary to their learning from their rabbi. Think about the final words of Jesus. He's been crucified, he rose from the dead, he's been with his disciples. And just before he goes back to the Father, in Matthew chapter 28, 18 to 20, he says these words, he says, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. And so as we consider the statement of Jesus, everyone then who hears these words of mine, we need to ask the question, what am I going to do with the words of Jesus? What am I going to do with the things that he taught me? During the course of the summer, we've looked at a number of different sayings, number of different aspects of words, words that Jesus spoke. We've, we've looked at words in regards to worry, following him, treasuring him. Words that talk about living for him, bringing the message to others. The fact that there's a need and a harvest. We've talked about forgiveness. We've talked about the things that we hang on to in life. We've talked about prayer. We've talked about last week the the impact of Jesus' final words, it is finished. And so we survey back over the last nine weeks and we say, what difference has it made? What have the words of Jesus done in our hearts, in our lives? But by the grace of God, have we worried less and trusted more? Have we followed well? Have we seen Jesus as the greatest treasure in all of life? Are we living out and proclaiming the gospel so that others can see and hear what Jesus Christ came to do? Have we been more forgiving? Do we hang on to the things of the world a little bit looser? Do we long to be in communication with God? Do we live in the victory that Jesus accomplished on the cross when he said, it is finished? Because here in this passage, Jesus says, anyone who hears these words of mine, and he calls for a response. A choice needs to be made. No excuses, no exemptions. Neutrality is impossible. A definite decision has to be made. All who have heard the words of Jesus either respond to them or they do not. There's no other possibility. And Jesus' words here reemphasize the importance of what he has just said. And he goes on to tell a parable. He tells a story of how one can know if they are wise or if they are foolish. And Jesus likens or compares how one responds to his words to two builders. What they are building represents their lives. Everyone who builds will build on one or two foundations. Where they choose to build will be revealed when the person, whether the person has been wise or foolish. And the way that this will be exposed is that everyone's house or life will be tested. There is no house that is exempt from the testing. And so Jesus begins by telling a parable. And in verse 24, he writes these words. He says, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. 
The person hears the words of Jesus and they, they, they not only hear them, but they put them into practice. It's not simply an admiring of Jesus' words going, oh, that's a really good, I'm going I'm to write that down somewhere because that's a really good saying to use sometime. It's more than information. But he makes his teachings a guide for how he lives. Someone who is wise, will life, their life will be changed, their life will be transformed because of the words that they hear and the words that, that penetrate their heart and their life. This person is committed to following Jesus well. And even though there may be times when this person has set out to follow Jesus, they may fail. You know that their desires and their actions are to show that by the power of the Holy Spirit alive in them and by the grace of God, they are desiring to implement Jesus' words into their everyday life. This person is like the person who builds his house upon the rock. The house built upon the rock, which is solid. You see, foundations in building are so important. I haven't built a lot of walls Houses, small retaining wall with a foundation. Last year at this time, we, we replaced our patio. We dug up the concrete slab that was there. And by instruction from my son, we needed to dig down another 8 to 10 inches, haul the dirt out, and bring in some crush and compact it. Why? So that when we laid the pavers, they wouldn't move. So the pavers would have a solid foundation to which, on which they would rest. And I've got to tell you, it was a lot of hard work. A lot of hard work. And likewise, I think being obedient to the teachings of Jesus, we need to understand it's going to take an effort. It's going to take work. In the parallel passage in Luke chapter 6, verse 48, it says, The wise man is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. Two important things. One, the foundation is on the rock. Second, the person who built on the rock dug deep. It wasn't merely on the surface. It was anchored. It was secure. Then Jesus goes on to contrast this person in verse 26, and he says, And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. And so we say, well, why is this man foolish? Because when you build on the sound, sand, you're not sure that it's not going to shift. Because when you build on the sand, you're not sure if it's going to stay even. Jesus says this man is foolish because he's putting all this time, this effort, this energy into trying to create, to build something that will not stand the test of time. Jesus says you will be foolish if you do not follow my words. And we go, oh, man, life is going good. Or by all appearances, if people look at your life, they're going, oh, things are going really great for him. But... There will come a time when it's tested, and what will people see then? What will you experience then? What will be exposed? And in verse 27, we are told, And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat against the house, and it fell, and it fell. The fall of it was great. Contrast that to, to the wise man who built on the rock and it says the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and it beat on the house, but it did not fall because it was founded on the rock. What made the difference? The foundation. What is the foundation? The foundation is following through on the, the teachings of Jesus and being obedient to what God has called us to do. Storms will come. It's not going to be just simply a gentle rain that smells nice after a long, hot spell. It'll be a heavy rain. It'll be a torrential rain. It is rain that is so heavy that it creates gigantic rivers of water that moves things out of its way. And not only will there be rain, but there's going to be storms. There's going to be wind. 
And we're told that the rain and the wind blew on the house. And the combination of these two, of the severest of testings that weather can bring against the house, will be present. Last Sunday, many of you may be aware of it, Hurricane Ida hit the Louisiana coastline. Winds up to 150 miles an hour. 240 kilometers an hour. I was thinking about that when I was driving on the highway last week. Going, the winds are going twice, more than twice of what I'm driving. It was classified as a category 4 hurricane and it brought up to it 20 inches of rain to already soaked and saturated ground. If you've seen it on the news, you've seen the destruction that it left in its path was absolutely devastating. But one of the things that we see in the path of this storm is we see how well things were built. We see the foundation upon which things were built. They were not bunkers that were rooted down, but things were ripped apart. Things were moved. And the storm revealed the quality of the work. And in the same way, the storm that we face will reveal what the foundation in life has been. It will reveal have we been a wise builder or a foolish builder? Are we following the words of Jesus or not? John MacArthur wrote this. He says, the house represents a religious life. The rain represents divine judgment. Only the life built on the foundation of obedience to God's word stands, which calls for repentance, rejection of salvation by works, and trust in God's grace to save through his merciful provision. This is the ultimate test. And in these verses, Jesus is, is referring to the final judgment. But I think what we build upon is also revealed in the storms that we may face in life. How does what you have built stand up when the pressures of life come? When difficulties arise? In the face of tragedy, when things don't go as you have planned, in those times, is your anchor sure? If you have been wise or foolish, will be revealed in the storm and once the storm has passed. Following Jesus is not about how much you know. It's about what you do with what you know. And Jesus taught his disciples so they would implement his word. He instructed his disciples so they would act on his word. In the NIV it says, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. And so the question that's before us is, do we want to be wise in life and in all of eternity? Implementing the teachings of Jesus, it's a lifelong process. The wise man's wisdom is shown in the fact that he builds his house on the rock, the most solid of foundations. Or, do we desire to be foolish? We listen to the words of Jesus. The foolish person is one who pretends to have faith, maybe has an intellectual commitment, maybe enjoys being around followers of Jesus. This person is one who hears the words of Jesus but does not put them into practice. But when the storms of life come, their structures, their lives fool no one, above all, God. And so this morning we have to ask the question, As we look at this parable, are we wise or foolish? What do we do with those words of Jesus? As I've been thinking about this passage, I've asked myself the question, so then why would I want to put into practice the words of Jesus? One, because I treasure Jesus. Because you treasure Jesus. Because you love him, because you know he's worthy. He's one who has saved you. 
You want to please him. You want to show your gratitude for what he has done. Two, so you can be wise. There are some people who want to be foolish. I'd rather be wise. And on that day when we stand before Jesus, Jesus will look at you and he will say, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. He'll see your motives, he'll see your actions, see your heart, and your desire to follow him and bring honor to his Father. I think you'd want to put the words of Jesus into practice so that you will stand the test of the storms, both here and now and for all eternity. Your foundation in Christ will give you the strength to get through. So like Paul, you would say, even in the storm, even in the difficulties, God's grace has been sufficient and his power has been made perfect in weakness. So that what you do in life will last and make an impact for all eternity. So what do we do to be wise? For me, I put it into four prayers. Because the reality is, is we need God's strength and God's work in us to to follow through. It's not something to say, I'm going to knuckle down, I'm just going to do this. The big word nowadays is double down. No, it's, it's God's spirit at work in your heart and your life. And the four prayers that I would pray, that I would put on my wall, would be, God, help me to treasure you. Because when you really love something, someone, it will determine your actions. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. God, in your grace, help me to do that. Prayer number two, God, help me to be wise and follow you well. Psalm 119 verses 1 and 2. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. God, help me to be wise. Because sometimes I have the tendency to lean to foolishness. Prayer number three. God, help me to see, to know, to value, and to act on your words in my life. Help me to see, to know, to act, and to value the things, your words in my life. Psalm 119 and verse 18. Open my eyes that I would behold the wondrous things in your law. Psalm 119 and verse 27. Make me understand the way of your precepts, and I will meditate on your wondrous works. Psalm 119, verses 14 to 16. In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Psalm 119, and verse 20. My soul is consumed with longing for your rules at all times. Prayer number four. God, ingrain your words in my life so that I will honor you with my actions. Psalm 119, verses 10 to 12. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. Psalm 119, verses 33 to 37. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, that I will keep them to the end. Give me understanding that I will keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not towards selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. Four prayers of application God, help me to treasure you. 
Help me to be wise and follow you. Help me to, to see, to know, to value, to act upon your word. And God, ingrain your words in my heart that I would follow Jesus well. As a church, we value gospel transformation in all of life. As a church, we, we desire to help one another build wisely. And I believe that one way we can do that is through gospel communities. A time to come together to remind each other of what Jesus has taught. A time to learn of Jesus. A time to support one another. A time to encourage each other. A very practical way to say, God, I, can, I was not made to do this on my own. I was made to do this with others. And sometime in the next three weeks or so, we're going to be starting up the gospel communities. If you want to be a part of that, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. Again, just a very practical way that we can encourage each other and remind one another to be wise in life. Do you want to live a wise life? Implement the teachings of Jesus for his Father's glory. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you this morning. We want to thank you for this simple story. Simple account, but with such heavy words. God, I pray that we have not simply hear, but God, that you would take what we hear and continually challenge us by your spirit to become more like you, to become more forgiving, to become more loving, to, to radiate and reflect the gospel of Jesus Christ, to be forgiving, to live in the victory that has come through Jesus Christ and what he has done on the cross, and in those words, it is finished. And so, God, wherever individuals we be at in this room this morning as we come together, help us to step closer to you, one who is worthy of all praise, honor, and glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.